And we're back with more of the Pope hey. on Film. Hey. Yes. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on Film. I mean, who isn't? It's so popular. It's taking over the nation. When we streamed last week, episode 444, we had. 2.3 thousand people watching us. Of course, it only said four on Twitch, but that's just liberal bias. Yes. Uh, that's Twitch shadow banning. That's just Twitch shadow banning. Yeah. Uh, but only the real fans, the true hardcore fans who have been with us since the beginning, would know the two main facts about the both of us. Two undeniably real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the two of us, America's hottest will-they-or-won't-they couple, the new Sam and Diane, it's Bunny and Mei Lin. First and foremost, Bunny, is the fact that when you are not doing the podcast, you are a celebrated circus clown. So tell us, Bunny, how did you get into the amazing, wonderful, complicated world of clowning? Well, I come from a long line line of clowns. My father was a was a serious, seriously big clown, uh, and I I just happened to have the shoes, you know. Nice. Uh, they were laying around, so I, I would just start wearing the shoes, and then there was the face paint and all of that, and it just it just became a thing and frankly i i whereas i'm world renowned and that's great i i wish people would recognize it for the fucking addiction that it is and how it's tearing my life apart i mean i'm sorry who pays one thousand dollars in a week for white grease mate grease fakes face makeup it's insane it's insane Every time I walk past a little car, I have to get in it. Yeah, that's got to be difficult. That's got to be difficult. I would like to give a shout out to Cousin Jaden. He wrote that one. My life is a horror story. Uh, maybe you could Maybe you could get on him. Uh, you should have been on that one clown season of American Horror Story. Yes. That, that was a real missed opportunity. And the second fact which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So this is the part of the podcast where I get a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well, and I reword it via my own unique storytelling razzmatazz. And that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of historic approximations. We dropped the S. Historic approximations, or as we like to call it, formerly known for years as Steve's historic approximations, as I called it repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wanted me to or not. But a dead name is a dead name, and we are moving on. This week, here on The Hap, we will be discussing the history of the legendary, historic, and vitally important to American society, the legendary hip-hop group that no one remembers, and why you should remember them. And also, how this massively historical hip-hop group is somehow inexplicably tied to Charles Rocket. Yes, Charles Rocket, once touted as Saturday Night Live's Next big thing. Yeah. It's like, yes, we know that all of the main cast of Saturday Night Live is left, but we've got an all new cast here for Saturday Night Live 1980, our sixth season, which will no doubt go down in history as our best season. And we've got a I... huge, massive star right here, Eddie Mer Eddie Murphy, can you move out of the way? There you go. Charles Rocket. Yeah. And then 
Charles Rocket would eventually end up being fired for saying the F word live on TV. Specifically, the episode was February 21st, 1981. Charlene Tilton was to was hosting that episode. And then after Charles Rocket was fired, they said, okay, well, we got rid of Charles Rocket. We really pushed him to be the next big thing. But now we've got someone even bigger, a massive star who's going to go on to huge things. This is going to be our next big thing. Eddie, Mur Eddie Murphy, get out of the way. There you go. Joe Piscopo. Really proud of that. I just came up with that whole bit off the top of my head, and it was hilarious. Yes, it was. So I, I, uh, I don't know about this being the worst season, but it was the most bizarre season. Yeah, I you watched know? an episode. I watched an episode from season six uh, for this hap. And uh, it was nigh unwatchable. I had a really hard time. It was nice to see uh, a young Eddie Murphy uh, on his in his prime, and it was nice to see the the centerpiece for this hap. But uh, and uh, Gilbert Godfrey was not unattractive when he was younger. <laughs> I was surprised. To see a young, dashing Gilbert Gottfried with a semi-normal voice, almost looking attractive. It was surprising. Yes. But yes, the, but this the is, but is if dope. there was ever a case of being the wish version of the original cast of Saturday Night Live, yes. that was the cast of this season, Saturday Night Live. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, he, he's Charles Rocket to, to try to bring it back in line here, yeah. Charles Rocket was clearly like the if if a corporate board was going to make Chevy Chase, it would be Charles Rocket. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, so you might be wondering, wow, how is Charles Rocket somehow tied to one of the most influential legends of hip hop that you've never heard of. Well, don't worry, we'll get there. So, um, Bonnie, quick question. Uh, probably should have been right at the beginning of the half, but it is what it is. How well do you know rap music, my friend? Meh. Not much at well, all. Um, okay, but that's, well, that's uh, like. We could take the word rap out of there and just say music, and it's pretty much the same answer. Good. I'm glad to hear you say that because you kind of need to know your rap music for this uh, for this uh, hap. You need to know a bit about the history of rap music and how it was born and everything. So, surprise, surprise, surprise. It's story time! I will be reading this book to you, Bunny. Okay. It is a uh, preschool board book called The Story of Rap. It's by the same people who made the book The Story of Rock, which I read on my kid-friendly YouTube channel. They did The Story of Rock, The Story of Rap. I didn't bother to uh, purchase The Story of Country, but there you go. The story of rap. Are you ready, Bunny? Yes. Okay. Rap was born way back in 73 in New York City at a house party. And that right there is DJ Cool Herc. He will be important to our uh, app later on. DJs mixed beats for dancing crowds. Speakers thumped and the bass was loud. There's a DJ Cool Herc, and he is uh, getting records and making beats. I, I thought DJ... maybe he was playing foosball? No. DJ's friends would make up rhymes telling stories line by line. So uh, DJ Cool Herc would get a beat going, and they'd just pass a microphone around, and people would just try and rhyme to the beats. And uh, look at that. It's me, pre-transition. What am I doing in this? 
I don't know. What am I doing in this book? I'm so confused. These rhymers were the very first MCs. No one had ever heard songs like these. Then came the great Grandmaster Flash, who taught us how to mix and scratch. He was the first person to ever do the... 80s rap came to stay, and Run DMC walked this way, and they always wore Adidas. Then straight out of California, we tuned into NWA. And uh, I read this last night to Eleanor to practice, and Eleanor said, what does NWA stand for? And I said, oh, not without almonds. <laughs> they were big fans of almonds, and they were always singing about nuts. This new sound spread so far and wide, no one could stop it, but people tried. And then here's all the angry people that are angry at the rap music. Then Soul met hip hop with a tribe called Quest. Ah! I love their music. Electric relaxation is so good, and they do a they do a collaboration with leaders of the new school. Uh, the song is called Scenario. Ah, I've had that memorized since eighth grade. Tupac faced Biggie as East Coast battled West. 90s rap held a message. They were rebels with a cause. Everyone was listening to Snoop Dogg and Nas. Lauren Hill had a voice that could make you cry, and Missy had the moves that were super fly. Now Kendrick's staying humble, and Kanye's a bastard. Yes. I'm covering him up. He doesn't get to be in this story anymore. Jay-Z has the flow that will never, ever leave us. Rap is for the people, just like from the start. It's more than music. It's a work of heart. And that is the end of that story. Yay! Suddenly a wild story time appears. So I wanted to, to, to do that story time in the middle of the half because it's important. So, uh, uh, okay. So hip hop music came from the Bronx in the 1970s and it bloomed from there. And when you think of the early days of hip hop music, there are names that fans and even some hip hop noobs would recognize. Names like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, uh, the Sugar Hill Gang, Curtis Blow, Tom Jones, Melanie. Well, I've got a brand new pair of roller skates. You've got a brand new key. I've been obsessed with that song lately. I have no idea why. Oh, yes, I do. It's it, There was a skit about that song in the new season of Kids in the Hall. But I've been yeah. listening to that song over and over again. It just is the perfect soundtrack to my madness. So, okay. But one name that usually gets forgotten in the history of hip-hop is funky four plus one and it's kind of criminal that their name isn't up there with the other founding fathers of hip-hop um the subject of this hap is funky four plus one this is how the story goes so like in the beginning of our story today the story of rap here's dj cool herc they would have these uh parties these house parties and these block parties and these neighborhood parties and his sister would uh you know oh here's a record player and here's some speakers and we'll play some music and there you go so she said oh well uh my brother has more records and it's kind of i'm gonna get him to do these parties and he would play these records dj cool herc he would be doing these parties in the bronx and it really was the birth of hip-hop he would get a disco turntable, which is this right here. And he would learn that, okay, uh, instead of playing one song, you know, there's a beat in it, the break, the the drum bit, and the beat was always really, really good. So using the turntable, he would he would isolate the beats and then just let the beat continue over and over again. And then People would pass the mic around and would rhyme over the breaks. And it, he became so popular with his uh, house parties that 
people would come just to dance to the breaks that he was creating as a DJ. So the dancers, this is a fun fact, the dancers were known as break girls and break boys, which would eventually be shortened to B-girls and B-boys. And that's where that came from. The term B-boy came from the people who would dance at DJ Cool Herc's parties. And not a lot of people know that. And were they also break dancers? Uh, break dancing came from this. Yes. I, w- I would I would think that that sort of leads into that. Yeah. So uh, so it's the seventies, and DJ Cool Herc's Bronx parties are the place to be. Cut to a young man named Baron Chappelle and his family. They move into the Bronx, and young Baron Chappelle has an older brother, and he's mad popular, and he's and he's going to all of these parties. He starts hanging out with DJ Cool Herc at all of his Bronx house parties. And little Baron Chappelle is all jelly. He's super jealous. He's like, I want to go. I want to go to the house party. Can I go? I want to hear the beats. Please let me go. Can I go too, please? And the cool older kids are like, we don't want this little kid to party with us. You know, because we might do a little drinking, do a little. <laughs> so we, we don't want this kid here. So like, okay, okay. Uh, okay, little little brother, listen up. You can come with us, but there's a catch. You're Cool Herc's roadie now. You set up his shit, you carry his stuff, tons of heavy stuff, speakers, his record collection. This is going to be hard work and you'll want to give up. But Baron really wanted to go to these parties and he didn't give up. He loved this new music, so he would set up everything for Cool Herc and bring his records and he loved this new music that DJ Cool Herc was pioneering in New York so much that he'd study Cool Herc and when he wasn't being Herc's roadie Little Baron Chappelle went out and bought the same records that Herc was using and he got so good that Baron's brother introduced Little uh, Baron Chappelle to another inspiring young MC, a guy named Keith Williams. So uh, these two wannabe MCs joined together. Baron Chappelle became DJ Baron, and Keith Williams became DJ Breakout. And they found an MC who rhymed well, a guy hilariously named Kevin Smith. He would go on to be named K.K. Rockwell and not MC Silent Bob, which I think was a mistake. Uh, I'm a little bit upset about that. I do like the K.K. It reminds me of K.K. Slider from uh, Animal Crossing. Um, They formed a group and they called themselves the Disco Brothers. And as time went on, the group would add more and more people, including... A female MC named Sharon Green, who would become Shaw Rock, now widely considered the first female rapper ever. So already, but, okay, I, I need to interrupt though. But like, the rappers going by KK weren't those. Like, didn't you have to be over the Mississippi line to be KK rapper? I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I don't you know where KK West Rockwell's Mississippi, from. I'm pretty sure. Other, Maybe other, he's than from that, Memphis. other than that, you would you would have to be a W rapper. A W rapper. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. So uh, already this band is historic, and we haven't even gone to Charles Rocket yet. So they're now a hip hop group. They're headed into the '80s. They are one of the first groups in the Bronx to do hip hop, apart from Grandmaster Flash and his people. They were also the first rap group where everyone had their own separate mics. Back in the early days of hip hop, there would be one mic, one person would have it, pass it to the next. So before Funky 4 Plus 1, groups like the Sugar Hill Gang, you'd see Wonder Mike and Big Hank and Master G passing one microphone around. uh, Because Funky 4 Plus 1 was also one of the first rap groups to say, yeah, we're going to rhyme, but also. You know, we're big fans of, like, The Temptations and The Jackson 5. We're also going to dance. 
they were one of the first groups to put an emphasis on the dancing, which, uh, and then a lot of other groups would mimic that. And of course, Funky Four Plus One was the first mixed gender rap group ever. Already, it's pretty his. They are a pretty historic group. We haven't even gotten to the main gist of the historic approximation yet. And already, it is a crime that people don't know more about the group Funky Four Plus One. This is this is. They are the founding fathers and mothers of hip hop over here. They had a single that came out in 1980 called That's the Joint. It became their signature song. It would later be sampled not once on a Beastie Boys album, not twice on that same Beastie Boys album. It, the song That's the Joint would be sampled three times on the Beastie Boys' second album, 1989's Paul, Paul's Boutique. And this is a separate chat, but... When does sampling go from homage to ripoff? Yeah. It, it wouldn't be surprising that, like, oh, here are three uh, white guys from New York stealing a, a, a black group's entire thing. But, hey, that's a different half. Anywho. Okay, and just since we were on the conversation, I couldn't help it, but young MC is 55 years old. I just want yeah. to let you know. Yep. Yeah. Uh, huge fan of young MC. Your best friend, Harry has a brother, Larry. In five days from now, he's going to marry. He's hoping he can. you can make it there if you can, because in the ceremony, you'll be the best man. First off, who's getting married? Your best friend, Harry? Or is it Harry's brother, Larry? Harry's brother, Larry. Secondly, why are you his best man and not whoever the brother is? Yeah, why? There are a lot why of am, questions that Young MC has not answered. And why is the person who is telling me that I am the best man? First off, not Larry. Okay, because I think this should be coming from Larry himself. But first off, it's not coming from Larry. And second, he has to tell me. In detail, who the fuck Larry is. And so also, why am I the best man? And why are you being told that you're the best man five days before the wedding? Yeah. It sounds like you had a you had a, a list of 19 names, all of which said no. Yeah. Is what that says to me. But uh remember that one episode where we took like an hour breaking down the lyrics to young mc's bust a move yes i do that was fascinating and what a who fascinating is telling episode. me this because it's not even not a, okay not only is it not coming from larry who wants me to be his best man it's not coming from it's not even coming from my best friend harry yeah so it's like I'm at a bus stop and some dude walks up to me. Are you, are you friends with Harry? Yeah. Knows brother Larry? What do you do with I'm, this? Yeah. So, um, 1980 single. That's the joint. It's one He's of those 55 songs. Today. He's 55 right now. Nice. Nice. He's uh, old MC. Yeah. So, uh, Funky Four Plus One song, That's the Joint, it did make a Rolling Stones list of the 500 uh, most uh, greatest rap songs of all time. Um, it got some radio play, and uh, it's one of those songs where you might not know it, but if you heard it, if you heard the hook, it's the joint. You you might recognize it. You might. But, I mean, it's, it's no... Uh, it's no rapper's paradise. So, Funky Four Plus One, Trailblazers, Pioneers, they were also the first rap group to receive a major label record deal. Again, I don't know why people don't know about four, Funky Four Plus One. I mean, <laughs> Run DMC, 
NWA, A Tribe Called Quest, Wu-Tang Clan, BTS. None of them would exist without Funky 4 Plus 1 leading the way. Very serious about that. Okay. And on top of their pioneering, they had another very important first. So let's put a pin on Funky 4 Plus 1 and let's talk about the sixth season of Saturday Night Live! Widely considered by many to be the worst season of Saturday Night Live. The reason for that is they had the original cast of people that slowly but surely started leaving. And then finally, after season five, all of the cast was like, hey, it's time to go our separate ways. And even, um, uh, what's his name? Lorne Michaels said, yes, I'm going to be taking a break too. And NBC said, yes, take a break. Take all the time you need. We'll be here. Okay, is he gone? We're doing the show without him. Get people together. And so that was the sixth season of Saturday Night Live. If it wasn't for uh, Eddie Murphy, um, there's a good chance that SNL would have only lasted six or seven seasons, and that was it. And it was Gilbert and Godfrey, fun- too? Because, like... Gilbert Godfrey, yep, for who, one season. Who else was there? Like, I remember Eddie Murphy, Denny I remember Dylan, Joe Piscopo, and I remember Charles Rocket. And like, that's it. Charles Rocket. Charles Rocket was doing Reagan at the time. Uh, Gilbert Godfrey was in a surprising amount of things. Denny Dillon, uh, a woman. Uh, don't remember anybody else off the top of my head. But they really pushed Charles Rocket. He got his own uh, um, bit on the show called like the Rocket Report. And he yeah. was a man on the street segment. And uh, the funny thing is that they're like, OK, we've got our group. This is our group. They're going to be huge. They're going to be massive. They're going to be the next big thing. People won't care about Chevy Chase or Bill Murray or Gilda Radner. They're going to be talking about Denny Dillon and Charles Rocket. Shit, we need a black. We need at least one black person. Get me a black really quick. We're about to do the show. Get me a black person. Oh, we saw an 18-year-old named Eddie do stand-up. I don't care. He's on the show. Get him over here. And that was Eddie Murphy. If it wasn't for that, uh, SNL would have died a while ago. So... It's the sixth season of SNL. Charles Rocket is there. And uh, Charles Rocket really has nothing to do with this hap. I, I just like dunking on Charles Rocket. <laughs> they they did a, a parody of Who Shot JR from Dallas. Uh, JR, as in the beer. And uh, Charles Rocket got shot. And at the end of the episode, live, they're doing like the goodbyes. And they said, uh, so Charles, you got shot today. Any idea who it was? And without thinking, he said, no, I've never been shot before. I'd like to know who fucking did it. And, uh, oh, big scandal. And eventually they let him go. But then eventually they let everybody go except for Joe Piscopo and Eddie Murphy, who would sort of become the rock of the show for Him a and while. Boy. Ah, good. So, season six, episode ten of Saturday Night Live, they get Debbie Harry to host. Because Blondie is huge at the time. Right? So, Debbie Harry is host and musical guest. Which they don't do often. You know, they do it for Paul Simon. They do it for Adele, Lizzo. You know who was really good, who really blew me away? Halsey. Yeah. She was great. She was really funny. I don't know any of her music, but she was great on SNL as a host. Oh, yeah, Miley Cyrus. That's another one. And Debbie Harry. And they say, okay, you're going to be host. You're going to be musical guest. You're going to do two songs. But they say, we haven't done this that often. So if there's another band you want on, anyone at all, let us know. We'll get them on SNL. And she goes, 
You said anybody, right? Yes, anybody you want, any band, any group, any musical artist, anybody, you let us know. And Debbie Harry's like, you did say anybody, right? Like anybody I want, anybody I want. That's what you're saying, anybody. I want Funky 4 plus 1. And SNL and NBC are like, are you sure? I know we said anybody, but here's the thing. They're a rap group. No rap group has ever played on television ever. Yeah. Period. It's the sixth season of Saturday Night Live. Rappers on TV aren't a thing. No hip hop group had ever performed on a, on a network ever. Period. And they're like, I, I don't, we don't know about this. And Debbie Harry's like, they are the pioneers of rap music in America. You get Funky 4 Plus 1 on SNL or I Walk. And they said, okay, but uh, they're going to be the last thing. <laughs> and they were the last thing. I saw that whole episode. And you see Funky 4 Plus 1. The funny thing is, is that at the time that they performed on Saturday Night Live, they had added an extra member. They were always adding extra members. So at the time that they finally made it on Saturday Night Live, they weren't called Funky 4 Plus 1. They were called Funky 4 Plus 1 more. But uh -huh. they performed they performed their, uh, their single, That's the Joint, on Saturday Night Live and became the first hip-hop rap group to ever perform on television, period. Ever. So again, I have no idea why people don't know Funky 4 Plus 1, but dang, they helped create, they were basically the Alexander Hamilton of hip hop. You know, here's the founding father that nobody talks about. Well, we I, remember, I remember Miranda. that Debbie Harry got heavily into, into rap and hip hop to the detriment yeah. of rap and hip hop to the detriment of rap and hip hop but good on her for be because of her she was the reason why rap made it onto television for the first time i ever. i just find it amazing that that rap was absolutely the whitest thing Blondie had ever done. Yeah. Yeah. But isn't that something? Funky 4 plus 1. When yes. you think of yeah. the birth of hip-hop, you think of all these groups, but you don't think of Funky 4 plus 1, but man, the, the first ever female rapper, the first rap group to get a major record deal, the first rap group to ever perform on television, and it was right next to Charles Rocket, who would be fired, I think, I believe, the next episode. I believe because this this was uh, the Valentine's Day episode, and Eddie which Murphy, also she... means that I most likely saw it. Yeah, yeah, Funky Four Plus One. It's the joint. <laughs> it, it it's. I saw it right before we did this chef hap this yeah. hap because we dropped the S. Uh, I, I I I I kept watching, I kept watching, and I kept watching, and I was like. They're coming back. This is just a fucking joke. Yeah. They're, they're coming back. Like, we're going to yeah, come back with, from a commercial break, and there's going to be Bill Murray, you know? Yeah. And there's going to be Garrett Morris giving the news for the hear, hearing impaired. <laughs> yeah. The killer bees in today's tough stories. <laughs> uh, that's freaking wonderful. They're coming back. But, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, so I, I, I'm sure I saw it. Yeah. So I, I I watched season six, episode ten for this podcast right before doing the podcast. It's nigh unwatchable. I, I, and and I bet you're asking yourself, gee. I wonder if Joe Piscopo managed to do his Frank Sinatra impression. It's Joe Piscopo. It starts with a Frank Sinatra impression. Yeah. The whole episode starts with 
Ronald Reagan talking to Frank Sinatra because Joe Piscopo. Yeah. Uh, the wonderful book, Live I, from New I York. I survived, at Saturday Night. although there were deep scars, but I yeah. survived. I'm from Jersey. You from Jersey? Oh, I'm from he Jersey. He does that skit. He oh, does that skit oh. in the episode. It drove me nuts to have to watch one of those skits. But I will say, it's, it, it, it's, it's the only thing worse than Opera Man. Yeah. I will say, I hate Joe Piscopo. Uh, the wonderful book, Life from New York at Saturday Night, a whole, an oral history of Saturday Night Live, has a wonderful quote. Eddie Murphy's success went to Joe Piscopo's head. It's fun yes. to dunk on him, and he's uh, insane. That being said, I, when I was a kid, I loved the movie Wise Guys. Yeah. Do you remember that? I don't think so. It was uh, Joe Piscopo and Danny DeVito, and they work for a mafia guy, a mafia okay. boss who's played by Captain Lou Albano. And they're, they say, here's a million dollars. Go bet it on this horse. And they go to bet his money on this horse. But they hear a tip and decide to bet it on another horse, which loses. And the horse they were supposed to bet on wins. And suddenly people are trying to kill them because they lost the money. It's actually a, a, a pretty charming, funny little gangster movie with Joe Piscopo, Danny DeVito, and freaking Captain Lou Albano in it. The weirdest cast. But it was a Piscopo really funny movie. Was accidentally in a couple of things. Yeah. I I I I don't think that any of them actually benefited from Joe Piscopo hey. being there. Hey. Don't interrupt me, bunny. My <laughs> brother interrupted me once. Once. Yes. Definitely definitely that. another another Great movie that Joe Piscopo was in. Accidentally in. Uh, yeah. Along with Dead Heat. Yep. When Joe was in his bodybuilding phase. Yeah. I I still quote Johnny Dangerously a lot of times when I cuss in front of the kids. Oh, a farging ice holes. You piece of sheep. Yeah. You farging. His whole, like, I still cuss foreign. But that's it for historic approximations this week. That's it for our HAP. Uh, be sure and join us next time for more educationally uneducational fun with historic approximations. Or, as we call it, and cut on that. But.